Hello everyone, how are you doing? Thank you for coming out this morning to hear about Marx. I love talking about Marx, it's incredibly interesting. So this is a fun presentation. Um, I've not got tons of time, so I'll try and go through it. Who thinks that the philosophies and ideas and, um, yeah, the philosophies and ideas in people's heads in society ultimately determine the course that the society will go on? Is a, a, do you have a philosophical theory of history? Who thinks um, society has more of an effect on people's ideas and ideas don't do that much? Yeah, society just goes along in some kind of direction and you can hang around at your Austrian economics conference, but in the end of the day, what does it all amount to? It's just idle chatter. Who thinks the material forces of production, the tools and machines that we use to make stuff determine the course of history? Yeah, it's a pretty wacky thing. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so some people actually think so. We've got some libertarian Marxists here. <laughs> well, you know, you sometimes hear libertarians say things like, Oh, there's no point in engaging people with discussion. You know, we need to rely on things like Bitcoin and 3D printing to, to change society, which is, to me, kind of like a, a Marxist libertarian argument saying, you know, let's forget about ideas. They're not that important. It's really technology and, uh, and the means of production which determine society. So that is the central claim in my opinion, the central claim in Marxism is that the tools and instruments which we use to make stuff determine the quality of society. So, as we know, industrial progress just goes and goes. We create new machines, new technology, because we want to have a better life. And um, when the, the man advanced from Stone Age to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, it was all about changing the tools we used. Um, now, no one, no one denies that tools and machines and factories and things have a decisive effect on society. Um, but it's just that in Marxism, they are the ultimate thing. They determine your consciousness. Um, in every stage of society, there's class relations. So, you know, a free man and a slave, um, the lord and the serf, the guild master and the journeyman. So, uh, uh, and, um, the, and these class relations are determined by the developmental stage of the means of production. Um, obviously, in a capitalist society, you have capitalists and factory workers. So, but here's the interesting thing. Which I, um, you, what happens is you get a class structure in a whole a structure of society which exists in Marx's view to facilitate the development of the means of production. But at some point, the, the structure that emerges to facilitate the means of production comes to hamper it. Um, I'll give you an example in a minute. And he says the, 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 the superstructure of society comes into contradiction with the desire of the means of production to um, progress, to develop. Um, and that's not a contradiction like, you know, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, but Socrates isn't mortal. Like we understand a logical contradiction in philosophy. He's using the word contradiction in the Hegelian sense, which means that there's a tension that has to be resolved. Why does the tension have to be resolved? because Hegel says so. Uh, contradictions can't continue to exist. There's not um, any evidence given for that, but it's just because Hegel said it. So, so when this happens, the, the, we've, we've got a structure of society, the means of production want to continue to develop, but they're coming into tension with the 
whole legal ev edifice of society. Um, and, and it's like the chicken's too big for the egg and needs to break out. And that's when you have class struggles and revolutions and to change society, to make it safe for the continuing development of the means of production. So um, Marx cites the move from feudalism to capitalism as an example of this pro process. As you know, in a feudal society, only aristocrats can own the means of production. But towards the end of feudal society, you have the beginnings of a wealthy merchant class. And they're going to go, well, this is ridiculous. We want to expand production. We want to own the means of production. But those aristocrats won't let us. And this, in the Marxist view, leads to the um, English, French, and American revolutions, which he called uh, bourgeois democratic revolutions. And in the same way, their, their aim is to destroy the vestiges of feudal society to make the world safe for the new philosophy, which is liberalism. Um, and then you have all the liberal economists, Adam Smith and what have you, and the Marxist view, the ideas in their head are just a product of the superstructure of their society. They're phantoms. So they, they didn't originate these ideas. They didn't reflect on... Uh, I mean, they did. They think they did. They think they came to them from reflections. But actually, they're just a mouthpiece for the, for the superstructure of society, which allows the development of the means of s production. And you need someone like Marx and Engel Engels to come along and tell them that they're just propagandists. Are you getting it so far? Do you agree that this is like... Well, I mean, we, we can be like quite critical of Marx, but just to come up with this stuff is like incredibly interesting, in my opinion. So, so, so in the same way, this bourgeois revolution needs to be smashed, well, completed by the proletarian revolution, and then we get the wonder of communism. And the, the fact that the, that Marx could look at the move from feudalism to liberalism and say, and that allows him to say, well, every stage of society is better than the last one. In the same way that capitalism is better than feudalism, communism is going to be better than capitalism. So, but, but this is, this is bound to happen with the inexorability, try saying that after a few, um, the inexorability of a law of nature, right? This is a sort of, this is, this is how history works in Marx's view. So, so it, he, he claims to be scient, scientific in his view. This is a scientific worldview he's positing. Have you been following the science? OK. So that was meant to get a bigger laugh than that. Let's try again. You can just go, ha, 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 this time. Have you been following the science? Excellent. Good. I know it's early in the morning, but come on, guys. Right. So, one, so the social relations need to be rearranged, OK? In a slave society, human beings can be owned. In a liberal society, they can't. However, they can be forced to sell their labor to a capitalist. Um, OK, so let's see. OK, so as such, Marx and Engels have a very favorable view of technological process because every innovation is just leading to the destruction of capitalist society. So, and I just mentioned, I think it's really important to understand that for Marx, class, the class struggles which, the class struggles are a product of the historical stage of development as the means of production because people go to think of Marx class theory first. But I think that's like, even Marxists, they don't actually understand that the class struggles just a manifestation of the tension w between the means of production that want to continue to develop and the, the social structure is limiting them from developing. Okay. So 
Now, the interesting thing about this story is these class conflicts, none of these people, they're not caused by ideas. It's not like, oh, you have an ideology of socialism and I have an ideology of capitalism. That's just what it looks like to us because we're in it. What's actually happening is these forces are moving through us. Um, so it's like the kind of old parable of the fish, you know, the fish that asks the octopus, where's the, can you show me the way to the ocean? I keep on hearing about this ocean. We can't understand, we don't know we're in the ocean. So we think we're having arguments on Facebook and Twitter, but it's just, uh, we're lousy bourgeois apologists for the old system. Um, so, but then how do Marx and Engels, how can Marx and Engels understand this? Well, he says, even though it's unscientific to say what socialism looks like because it's not happened yet, we can deduce, we can deduce by looking at history where it's going next. So that's how um, he, Marx was able to discover these laws, even though he's in it. Like, look at the past and then go, oh, this seems to be going, this, this is a pattern. Okay. So, the idea that technological advancement of a society dictates its class structure is interesting, but is it true? Hint, Mises says, no. Um, he doesn't deny that technology has a profound effect on society. In fact, lots of philosophers and historians have pointed that out. But he just objects to the idea that the means of production give rise to the entire economic order. And it's not like, you know, there's this overmind in an ant colony and outer, you know, in the sci-fi with the, you know, controlling them through planets, the queen, like the means of production psychically controls you. Uh, no, that's silly, says Mises. He doesn't use the ant colony al analogy, by the way. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, Robert Heinlein or anything like that were, uh, I don't think he was a fan. Um, but he says, this is, Marx says, the hand mill made feudal society, the steam mill capitalist society, and Mises says that's ridiculous because uh, he gives like three main objections. Um, the first is that technological innovation isn't something like that you can just material or concrete that you can just point to in the world. Like someone needs to actually think, come up with the idea to improve the machines. So you see a hand mill and you go, gosh, wouldn't it be awesome if we ran that by steam? Boom, then you've got a steam mill. So, um, so there, there's no mental process that you can assigned to innovation. Uh, it doesn't exist outside um, people's ideas give rise to innovation, in fact. So secondly, just because you've got the techno te technological design um, knowledge to design new gadgets doesn't make them a given. You know, those countries in Africa, they know what they need to become rich. They need machines and technology. Uh, all the designs are there available but uh, already, but they, need, they don't have the capital. So each step forward in the road to technological improvement, you know, you need the capital to do it. So, and, and that, requires a, that requires an ideological structure. For example, if the ideology in the society is socialism, you can't accumulate capital because there's no private ownership of capital. If you're in um, some country where you need 12 to 36 months to get a license to open a business, that's not going to work either. Um, no one's going to bother to save their money in a country where the cops can just come and, and, and take your business off you. So that requires an ideological structure to even create an environment where um, capital can advance. So. Uh, Marx, would, uh, Marx would give you the impression that the tools and machines are just spontaneously generated out of thin air. And finally, Mises points out that um, in order to even use mach oh, machines, you have to have social cooperation under the division of labour. So um, no, no machine can be constructed and put into use under co conditions in which there's no division of labour at all or even a rudimentary stage of it. So how is it even possible to explain the, the existence of society by tracing it back to production when the means of production themselves 
only appear from an existing social fabric. So, um, let me see, I'm just going to skip forward because we're short on time. Um, okay. I've got some other miscellaneous objections to Marx. Um, you know, people in different eras have come up with similar ideas. Mozi, the Chinese philosopher, came up with a philosoph philosophy similar to utilitarianism. Um, you know, Monaco and um, Liechtenstein are the only remaining pure monarchies, but they have similar, you know, similar social structures to other capitalist societies. There's railroads in communist societies. There's railroads in um, Western societies. Um, so uh, there, 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 there's the classical and romantic art in every culture. Just to, um, uh, so also, what qualifies as a means of production now? If you're a podcaster like me, your laptop's your means of production. Um, so are we then, you know, well, some people would say this now with apps and whatnot, you know, that is the, the laptops using us. We're, we're preconditioned by our machines to go on Facebook and we're delivered to advertisers. So, um, and, and interestingly, how are we doing? Okay, yeah, I, I was, uh, I think that it's, having said all this, it's good to take maybe the, the most plausible rendering of the argument. And for me personally, if I was a Marxist, um, I would say like things like, you know, Napster and file, file sharing websites did actually force a change in intellectual property law. So that's kind of like proof that, that you know, the, the means of production were inhibit inhibited by the social structure. And um, if you look at the way that dating apps have changed the way that people date or um, social media, Google, big tech, oh, they're influencing us. I'm sure if I was a Marxist, I could come up with all sorts of theories about when we look at society today, about how um, the means of production are really driving things. And it's not, it's not uh, our ideas, but we're just kind of blindly um, being forced by the, these alleys. And there was like all these philosophers like Foucault and Heidegger that were concerned that we're like, Dri technology is driving us off a cliff. Um, the Unabomber, uh, Ted Kaczynski, you know, he wrote that manifesto where he said, ah, industrial society is alienating and whatnot. And, and, and they said, we, we, you know, we, we were pushed down a deterministic path. So there's been more like, um, when we look around society, uh, we might, if we, if we weren't sort of free market orientated, we might find cause to think, oh, well, maybe Marx was onto something. But I, I just want to give you one example of a Marxist um, that I, I remember I really liked studying, uh, the philosopher of music, Theodore Adorno. Are we? Yeah, OK. Um, he critiqued pop music for its like standardized structure and, uh, you know, um, to listen to good classical music, you need to have heard what you heard before to hear what, like, you know, in the Nutcracker, it goes, dun, 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 dun. And then later on, it goes, bum, ba, da, da, dun, 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 dun. But you don't understand that second bit unless you've listened to the first bit. But pop music doesn't do that. It's just, every song's completely interchangeable. And his critiques of popular music were very interesting. But then he comes up with this whole sociological theory, oh, the only reason why people like this crap is because they work in factories all day and they're used to repetitive tasks, right? So, so even though his critiques of popular music were very interesting and insightful, because he's got the Marxian framework, he's got this inevitable, like, crazy psychosociological theory to explain why people like standardized garbage. Um, and, and, and based on what evidence? So that's also the end point of Marx. So I say there's like a, two ways to go here. You can say, well, you know, Marx was maybe onto something with this idea that technology 
the t tools and machines that we use to produce the something are sending us down blind alleys, but also you can get like Teddy Adorno with his crazy haired brain scream schemes that, you know, people like it because they're emotionally repressed and work, uh, work. so then when they listen to some romantic schmaltzy dance, they're like, oh, now they can freely emote. But it's only because of capitalism that they would even want to do that in the first place. So that is my, my Cessian look at Marx's theory of history. I hope you got to understand Marx a little better and what's so interesting about him, and also a little bit about Mises as well. And there was some Anthony Samroff thrown in there for good measure. I have copies of my, pre I'm writing this book on Mises and Marx. I've got copies of my previous book. Please come out and get one. I'll sign it for you. It's about um, abolishing poverty and stuff like that. And I, I don't want to have to take them to my next location. So if you could grab one, that would be great. Thank you so much for listening. I enjoyed giving the presentation.